Um, we have state-of-the-art facilities with more on the horizon with our major, Measure A bond funds and the projects that are part of that. Um, and so we just appreciate, of course, the support from our community uh, to be able to uh, continue to build out the institution. Uh, we have outstanding transfer rates. Uh, prior to COVID, we offered um, great flexibility in our course offerings, and we will continue to do so um, as we move forward. Um, we offer um, 28 transfer degrees. And, um, you know, we have, um, as part of those transfer degree degrees, they are, students are guaranteed a transfer spot uh, within our CSU to earn a bachelor's degree um, if they earn that. Um, transfer degree. Um, we also provide uh, 57 associate, associate of Arts and Science degrees as well, and uh, 89 CTE certificates. So we have a lot of options uh, for our community. So our focus is really on careers, and it's really to get students on a career path early. Um, and it's critically important to shorten the time of completion. So instead of asking a student, what do you want to major in? Uh, we really need to ask students, what is your career interest and really get them on that on that career path. And so, you know, we really want their education to not only lead to a degree, but more specifically, we want that education to lead to a career. Um, and so that's the focus and the work that we're, that we're continuing to do at the college. I'll share with you some data here, um, just about um, our demographics. Um, so as of last year, uh, pre-COVID, um, we served um, just over 9,000 students during our fall enrollment. Um, historically, um, what we see is our fall is typically higher than our spring enrollment. <clears throat> the peak year of 2009 <clears throat> and 10 in this graph um, is what you see, and that's really on the heels of our last statewide economic downturn in 2008 and 9, uh, when enrollment typically increases at the community colleges. Uh, we have uh, folks that are looking for jobs, looking for transitions and advancement in their careers. Um, but with COVID and although the downturn in the economy uh, that we've seen, we haven't seen necessarily the increase in enrollment that we've seen in the past. And so uh, definitely we're in uncharted territory. Um, our fall enrollment for fall 2020 um, took about a 10% dip from last fall. <clears throat> and we just began uh, enrollment for our spring. Um, our spring semester begins January 19th. Um, and we're seeing a dip of about 5% in enrollment at the moment as well. And so, um, so we are in uncharted ter territories and, and um, you know, uh, we're hoping uh, to see an increase as we get closer to the start of spring. Um, you'll see briefly here, um, just a, a graph regarding our, our demographics and what you really see is that our student population is become, becoming increasingly more diverse um, over the years, um, as it is in the Tri-Valley, right? So uh, currently, um, our population of, of white students is at 33%, 30% um, for our Latino, Latina students, 18% for our Asian student population, and about 4% for our African-American uh, student population. So um, you can see the increase in our Latino, Latina populations and our Asian student populations compared to uh, 2010. And so um, certainly reflective of, of what's happening in the Tri-Valley as well. And 14% of our student population uh, from high school comes from Pleasanton, from the Unified School District here. Um, and that represents the second highest um, high school population that we see um, at the college. Um, I mentioned, you know, we're proud of our commitment to access in higher education. We have over 54% 54, 54 of our students are the first in their family to attend college, um, and about 33% of our students receive some type of financial aid uh, based on level of income. Um, and we know an associate degree makes a difference in annual earnings, right? So for our students who attend intend to transfer, we encourage them to earn their associate degrees as well, and then transfer. Um, that way they have something that they um, they have under their belt that they've completed. Um, it provides for better earnings if they do work while pursuing their bachelor's degree. So um, a lot of benefits for students who, who um, earn that associate degree um, and if they want to, to go on to their bachelor's degree as well before leaving LPC. And 
you know, our, our college and um, the Chabot Las Positas Community College District is just a great investment in our region. Uh, for every dollar that's invested in uh, education within our district, students gain um, $6.40 of lifetime earnings for each dollar. Uh, taxpayers gain uh, $1.10 in added tax revenue and, and public sector savings. And our society gains $9 in state revenue and, and social savings for every dollar that's invested. So we certainly um, contribute directly um, to the total economic impact um, in our region, which is Alameda County. So uh, briefly, you know, what makes LPC stand out? Um, we certainly are a top tier transfer institution. We have the eighth best transfer rate out of 116 colleges um, in the state. So we're very proud um, of the high transfer rate that we uh, produce here at the college. <clears throat> We have uh, guaranteed um, transfer degrees, as I mentioned, uh, for all um, 23 CSUs. Um, we also have guaranteed transfer degrees for six of the UC campuses, actually seven now, we just added um, an agreement with UCLA. Um, so you'll see the UCs in which students can earn um, a guaranteed admission to upon meeting those requirements at LPC to transfer. And we are, we are doing, um, um, more involved work in terms of partnerships specifically with CSU East Bay and really wanting to tighten up that, that transfer pathway from LPC to Cal State East Bay uh, to serve our region. And we're also um, engaged and excited about uh, the work that we're doing with UC Merced and, and also helping to um, improve those, um, those transfer pathways um, for students here in this region as well. We are um, very proud of, of the increase in our degrees that we've awarded for the past six years. Um, students are completing um, and they're earning in a timely manner. Um, certainly there's, there's more work to do, which is exciting. And, and we have some opportunities to, to do even better. Um, but uh, what we're seeing is, is that we are con consistently um, increasing the number of students that are completing here at LPC. And so that is um, something that we're certainly proud of. Um, you know, I mentioned that, um, students are also earning more money in their career fields. And um, what you'll see is that the training at LPC really makes a difference in hourly wages in our students. Students that come to the college for training <clears throat> see a, a direct increase in their wages um, once they receive the training at the college in um, any of our CTE programs. We also are finding that um, students are finding jobs related to their fields of study. Um, and so these figures are, are um, really among some of the best within the state um, in terms of, uh, you know, 73% of CT students in 2019 um, finding jobs related to their field of study. So you may know at LPC, we are uh, STEM strong. And so we have excellent programs. Uh, many of these programs are aligned with the guaranteed transfer degrees to four-year universities and institutions. <clears throat> and we are continuing to work uh, with industry partners to develop new curriculum uh, really to prepare students for industry certification. And so uh, we have community and industry advisory boards. Some of you may be um, serving on, on some of those boards at the, at the college. And so that really helps us inform our curriculum and to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our employers in our region. And you'll see some of the examples um, that we have as well. And you may know that we now have a bonded winery um, at the co college with our Campus Hill Winery. Um, so you can go to our website and, and order uh, Las Positas Campus Hill Wine uh, through our viticulture program as well. Uh, you know, Las Positas is also um, a STEM college, right? And so we have a great arts and performance um, in music um, and arts and, and performance art. And we have um, talented faculty, of course, that have developed great programs and educational experiences for our students as well. And um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with our middle college um, program. Um, it's an award-winning, long-standing partnership with Tri-Valley ROP, uh, Pleasanton Unified, Livermore Valley Unified, and Dublin Unified School Districts, in which high school students uh, take classes on our campus. Um, they earn their high school diploma while earning college credit um, as well. Um, we also um, you know, offer the concurrent enrollment, of course, where high school students, any high school student can take and enroll in college classes for free uh, through our concurrent enrollment program um, at the college. 
So we have uh, great opportunities for engagement. Um, we um, provide great opportunities for student life uh, through athletics, our student government and other leadership programs. Uh, we have an honor society, um, award-winning speech and debate team, um, and award-winning journalism teams as well. And we also have um, some unique programs, which we call learning communities. And, and these really um, are cohort-based uh, courses for specific populations, including students in our engineering tech program. Uh, Puente uh, serves many of our Latino, Latina student populations. Umoja serves our African-American student populations. Um, and you may know that we have an outstanding Veterans First program that serves our Veterans uh, program. And all these programs, uh, we see great success. And, and they have dedicated counseling that, that serve uh, these programs, which, which adds that added benefit uh, for students as well. Um, so I, I just really want to just highlight some of the institutional priorities um, for our college this year. <clears throat> and um, our focus is really about fiscal efficiency and stability. Uh, we know um, this is challenging times for everyone, um, including the community colleges. Um, as I mentioned, we're seeing a decrease in enrollment. Um, we are um, have experienced and, and anticipate a reduction in allocation uh, from the state. But fortunately, um, you know, our district has has really good financial footing um, at this point, and um, we believe we can weather the storm. It, it won't be easy, but um, you know we we um, are confident that that we'll we'll be able to to move through this. Um, we are going to be um, you know reducing some of the course offerings that that we're going to um, provide um, as we get into next year to anticipate what that budget may look like from the state. Um, we're also continuing to upgrade our technology, software, and educational tools as as we move into this environment in an abrupt manner. Right, we're learning. Um, and we're growing along the way. And so we're constantly enhancing um, what we're able to provide to students. Um, we are providing ongoing professional development for our faculty and staff as well. Um, and we certainly um, are in the process of finalizing our college educational plan um, as well. So that is our, our five-year educational plan for uh, 2020 to 25. And that certainly includes our goals and our vision and priorities for the next five years. And so that's been exciting work. Um, and so we'll have a product that we will be able to share um, at some point soon. Um, and certainly I know our, our board will be interested in, in reviewing uh, the work that's coming out of that. Um, as I mentioned, we're continuing to implement our facilities master plan. We're working on four new buildings. Uh, they're in different phases, but we have a horticultural facility, a viticulture facility, a public safety and advanced manufacturing facility and transportation. Um, and an academic support building. So a lot of new um, facilities uh, that will be coming on board um, at Las Posigas as well. And then lastly, we're gonna continue to build on our expanding our education, um, business and industry partnerships. Uh, really wanna create learning and working opportunities for our students. Uh, continuing the curriculum development that I mentioned earlier to meet the needs of our regional employers. Um, and so I'm excited about, about the work that's happening and will continue to happen. I just want to just touch on, on how we've responded to, to COVID um, in this environment. Um, and so really, you know, as, as you all know, health and safety has been um, at the forefront of, of how we've moved forward. Um, and of course, um, we've been intent on meeting the needs of our students. In terms of technology, um, we have a, um, a process where we lend out laptops and hotspots to students. Um, and we also have been um, very fortunate. Our, our state chancellor's office has really provided options for colleges and districts to provide grading flexibility for students during this environment where students can, uh, can drop from, from their courses if they need to um, and receive a, free re uh, a full refund. Um, and there's no uh, impact on, on their education um, in terms of their educational records during this environment. Um, you know, we provide um, a market um, every month. We, we have a free food distribution to our community. Um, and so we uh, certainly provide that to our students and our surrounding community as well. Um, and we have been able to provide um, some support services um, on campus for students, um, particularly um, our health services um, has been open. Um, and that's where students can receive mental health counseling. And so we don't want to overlook how important that service is. Uh, we contract out with Stanford Valley Care, um, who provides health services on our campus. And so we um, are providing excellent um, services to students, uh, particularly in mental health as well. 
Um, we also had the opportunity to provide some study space and open up some, some study space on campus during the fall uh, prior to the recent um, shelter in place. What we found was that, you know, students really, some students didn't have the environment at home um, to, that's conducive to their learning, to support their learning. So we were able to safely provide some individual study spaces and access to um, Wi-Fi and to um, computers in our, our tutorial center as well. Um, you know, and I also um, want to acknowledge that we are also mindful about the impact of, of this environment on our employees. Um, our district has an excellent employee assistance program, our EAP program, um, which is free to our employees and access to a lot of great resources. And so uh, we recently had a, um, a campus-wide town meeting and we had a representative from our EAP program come out and really walk us through the great resources and options that are available to our employees um, and their, their, their spouses and dependents as well. And so um, really wanting to focus on the needs of our students, but also certainly the needs of our employees as well. So moving forward, um, this is how we plan to proceed. We, uh, for spring of 2021, as I mentioned, uh, the semester begins January 19th. Uh, we are mostly online um, with an, in terms of instruction and providing student support uh, services virtually. We do have a number of, um, limited number, I should say, of what we call essential courses or hard to convert courses. Many of those are labs um, and those are aligned with um, sectors that um, our, our state um, has identified as being essential to the workforce. Um, so we um, have been able to offer in a safe way some, um, some limited courses on campus. And as I mentioned, some limited support services on campus as well. Uh, summer, we will um, provide mostly online instruction and virtual support services. <clears throat> the big question for us right now is, um, as we're in the midst of planning for our fall 2021 um, course uh, schedule and, and course offerings, we're really exploring some options to see if we can build in some, some limited face-to-face uh, -face instruction. Um, and really, it's going to be based, obviously, on, on um, state and county orders at that point in time. But really wanted to buy a little bit of time. And so we're pushing some of our timelines back to, to see if we can have uh, an opportunity to, um, to offer um, some more face-to-face -face instruction than what we're currently doing um, at the college. And so um, that remains to be seen, but uh, stay tuned. And with that said, I want to thank you for your time and for your attentiveness and I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer any questions and engage in any dialogue that you all would like to talk about. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Daryl. That was uh, a great update. Um, and I'm just going to, looks like we've uh, lost a couple folks, but um, just feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Uh, we don't need to do the chat. So uh, Herb, you always have a good question. Wow, put me on the spot. Daryl, awesome job. Thank you for what you're doing in our community. I, uh, my, my, my question is always around, you know, the, the small businesses. And I love what you said about asking kids, what, what's, not, what's not your major, but what's your career? And I think that's a great mindset that uh, I think as we work with these businesses, trying to rebound them out of uh, COVID, we need to focus on what, what they're learning in school. So is there one target business market that you find most of the college graduates going towards uh, that leave Las Positas? Gosh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, we have some, some, um, a number of great programs. Um, gosh, I don't know, Jim, if you have any, any, no, I, on that. I yeah. think it's really a cross section, just, you yeah. know, just in the same way that students are interested in a lot of different things. I, I can't really, uh, you know, I, I did want to mention if, if you're at all, interested in being more involved on campus, you know, we do have a foundation, Las Positas College Foundation, and we look for members of the community that are like you. I want to acknowledge Mark Sweeney for his contributions to the veterans program. Uh, you know, he's a Vietnam veteran himself. I want to mention John Sensiba was on our board for Las Positas Foundation. Thank you, John, for all your years of service. And Tim Sobranti, before he, you know, was uh, moved up into the big leagues with the trustees, he was one of our board members also. And I'm sorry if I'm forgetting any others, but, um, you know, it, it's easy to be on the board, on the foundation board. You could, it's Zoom meetings these days. You don't have to go anywhere. 
um, you know, we're just looking for your connections to the community. So, you know, follow up with me afterwards if you're interested. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. That's great. As I, I'm looking at, I, I see Sarah in the room and certainly Sarah, I know um, a lot of your work and effort aligns with a lot of what I shared this morning. So if there's anything that you'd like to offer or share, please feel free to do so as well. Thank you. Um, I don't think, I don't have a whole lot to add. I mean, the Career Center is there to support all the students and, and public. Um, lately, of course, it's the hospitality and the um, restaurants and um, area that's been the most affected by COVID. We are, we support the main industries in the area. Healthcare, of course, is the number one industry um, and transportation and logistics, construction. All of these programs are up at Las Positas, which is, um, as well as through the academies at the K-12s, which is great. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Uh, Peter? Yeah. Uh, Pete McDonald. So, um, we passed a bond issue, I want to say 10 years back, and then I was amazed the last time I was out at Las Positas, which was probably three or four years ago, at how completely built out or at least substantially improved the entire campus is. Where are you on kind of the build out of the physical plant and is there room for further expansion if it were needed? And, from the enrollment figures, it doesn't look like it is needed in the near future, but what about the longer term? Yeah, I appreciate that. Great, great question, um, Pete. We have, um, as you may know, we, we have the capacity to continue to grow, right, in terms of, of space um, at the college, which is unique, right? There are many colleges that are fixed and, and they, they aren't able to grow. And so we have that great opportunity um, and so we have um, four projects that are currently in, in phases uh, that we're bringing on board. Um, so we're really expanding out beyond our athletic field. So our, our center of campus is gonna shift out um, uh, to the uh, east um, of the campus. And so uh, we have, um, as I mentioned, a lot of um, programs that are supporting a lot of our CTE programs. So our, our horticulture uh, facility, our viticulture facility is coming on board. Um, we have a new academic services building, which will be great. Some new classroom space and labs for students as well, and faculty offices. Um, and then we have um, some additional facilities to support our public safety um, and our automotive uh, programs as well. So it's, it's an exciting time. And so we are anticipating uh, some further growth um, once we get out of this COVID environment. Um, and we're going to have uh, some amazing facilities uh, to teach and learn uh, from. So thanks, thanks for your question, Pete. Absolutely. Great. Ken, did you have a question? No. Are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you, Ken. Oh, yeah. No, I don't have a question, but oh. I do have something to say. Um, <laughs> Daryl, I just want to kudos, kudos for having one of the best uh, veterans programs of any community college in probably the whole United States. Yes. Uh, I'm with an organization that helps support the, the veterans at Las Positas. We provide grants and work with Todd Steffen whom I'm sure you know, and uh, and so I've gotten to know a lot about what's going on out there, and and I tell you what, it is it is very very impressive to me, the way that uh, that you guys are are helping out these veterans, and, and you know most of us when we think of veterans, we think of Mark, you know, from Vietnam or something like this, but these are these are young men and women who who've been in for the last four or five years. They're in their 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 low twenties, and they're veterans already, you know. It's, uh, and 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 we're helping them out with uh, with with all kinds of things and, and grants and yes. and uh, just just helping them acclimate to to the kind of to the college life. Yeah. So so kudos for you guys. Well, well, thank you, Ken, and 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 thank you, um, you know, for your support. Um, as you mentioned, we have a great team. Um, our veteran students are amazing. Uh, Jim knows firsthand. He 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 teaches uh, within that the cohort of that program, and so. Um, so we just appreciate the support of the community. It's, it's widespread um, and it's, it's much, much appreciated. So, so thank you, Ken, for acknowledging that. Absolutely. I could, I could say a few more words about that. Um, the, the, I just want to thank Daryl and the support of the college. You know, for some years now, for about the last five years, not every semester, but every once in a while, um, I'd say we, I've taught five classes of veterans only. So we have a veterans uh, English 1A class and it's focused around veterans. We read, we read books that are, uh, you know, central to their experiences and their lives. 
and uh, we have um, journaling. So where they journal and they write about their experiences. Uh, we have 13 different prompts that they respond to each week and then they share out in a group. It's been a little more challenging with COVID, but we still have a sense of community. I'm just finishing up this semester with a group of, I think we had 12, uh, 12 veterans. We've started to allow civilians into the class as well so that we can fill the class. And that's created a whole new dynamic. So we have young students that are freshman age coming in, mixing in with these veterans. And the students understand that they play a role of listening to the stories of these veterans and welcoming them home. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about transition. In fact, so much to the point where, you know, I went to St. Mary's College recently and pursued further education. I got my doctorate at St. Mary's and my dissertation was on this, on this issue of student veterans writing about their experiences and transitioning. So Ken, thank you for your support. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mention you earlier. No, no, supporters, I, but... I'm, I'm a very small cog in that wheel. Yeah, just, yeah so it it's a real honor and privilege for me to, to do that, so thanks. Career Center is also involved in that too. We're part of the engineering tech program when it was first went up and um, we have a tip sheet for, for transitioning veterans. It's, yeah, it, it's a whole family helping out those veterans. And to your point, Ken, you know, we, we get students from across the state that really yeah. are drawn to our program. Um, so we're not only serving students within our, our local region here, students are traveling to come to Las Positas College, um, particularly for the veterans program and the support that we're providing. So, so thank what, you. one of my students right now is in Texas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah so we had, a, we had one that program. came in every day from San Francisco that would go to just to go to the program. Oh, God bless Texas, that's all I can say. I have a question, Dr. Foster, regarding the dip in enrollment. Is, I'm just curious about that. I know I have a, one of my children is at Las Positas and he doesn't like online learning, but he's kind of managed to, to play the game. Yeah. What, is, what are you attributing to that dip? Yeah, I, I think we, um, it's, it's a little bit of everything, right? I think part of it is, is that online learning, right? I think we find that some students just um, don't want to be in that environment and, and are choosing to just kind of step away um, until they can get back to face-to-face -face mm -hmm. instruction. So we're certainly seeing some of that. We're seeing uh, some of the demands of students who um, are, are needing to work to support their family, right? So they're stepping away. Uh, what we found was we dug a little bit deeper. We looked at um, our data from uh, fall 2019 compared to our data now of fall 2020 to see the differences. And um, really across the board, you know, we're, we're seeing that, that decline. But what we're finding is mostly um, what stood out to me was the number of males that we're losing um, in this environment as well. And so um, we're going to really need to dig a little bit deeper to kind of um, determine what, what's happening there um, and, and why that may be happening. Um, so a lot of different reasons, you know, we, we were hoping that maybe we could leverage and, and take advantage of maybe the, some of the students that were maybe intended to go to a four year, maybe wanted to stay close to their home and, and maybe would be choosing to, to attend, um, you know, Las Positas instead of that. Um, we didn't see the growth that we were anticipating, although I, I will say that our, our summer, the summer after COVID, um, we, our summer was just at full capacity. Mm -hmm. So we had a great response during that summer. Uh, so we anticipate that this, this upcoming summer we'll, we'll certainly see something similar. Um, but that's a, that's a great question, Jamie. So we're really continuing to kind of dig into the data to kind of get a sense of, of what's happening there. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you have any other insights on that from your, your perspective. No, um, I don't. It, it's, it's just a puzzle. You know, it just seems like in this environment, we should see a, you know, a surge, sorry about the word surge, a surge in enrollment mm -hmm. that um, it just makes so much more sense, uh, you know, because why why spend big bucks to send your kid away when they're really just going to be on Zoom anyway? Um, it's, it's, we're, the best, we're the best deal you know, in education, and uh, somehow that's just not trickling down. I did put in the chat that I think we had heard from one of our fellow board members recently in the foundation that um, she had heard that it's really you know, students going back to work, having to work to support family that is driving down that enrollment. That may just be one piece of it, but it, I think it's just a real puzzle for us. I, I noticed, um, this is just anecdotally, that uh, we, we recruit at universities across California, and uh, we do a lot of internships, starting with leadership programs for sophomores and juniors. <clears throat> and there's a lot of people who took a gap year this year whose parents were concerned about any um, interaction, and the students 
didn't want to have, didn't want to miss the college experience of being around other students. Yeah. And so in the four-year universities, just, and this is, like I said, it's only anecdotal. I, I don't have any, any data on it, mm -hmm. but we've seen a lot of students decide just to not, just to take a year off and, uh, and, and to maybe work and maybe need, not even out of necessity just to, um, just to wait until I can get a more normal college experience. Yeah, absolutely. Good, um, Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I think uh, you had your hand raised. So uh, yeah. Yes, Daryl, great presentation. Thank you so much. I'm always impressed um, that you, what, what, what you guys are doing out there. Um, what is the graduation rate? Is there a way to judge that or uh, 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 right, uh, kind of? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. We, there's, there's so many different uh, ways to measure, you know, quote unquote, graduation rate or completion. Um, you know, because part of it is we have so many students that are coming to the college for, for so many different reasons, right? So really, um, you know, we're providing students who are coming to our, earn that, you know, CTE certificate. We're seeing students who are, are solely coming to transfer, um, some who choose not to get a degree at all and just kind of come in and get the requirements and, and transfer on. Um, so just the community college system overall has been really challenged by, by what that looks like. Um, we also, you know, the metrics that the state has used is really kind of a six year window. So we're really looking at students when they, when they begin and within a six year window, you know, do they complete within that, within that time frame? And so, um, so it's, it's a challenging metrics for us to, to, you know, to measure for those various reasons that I, I stated. Um, and so really the way that we land on that is really looking at, um, you know, the number of students that we have that are intending to earn a degree. Um, and then we capture the number of degrees that, that we, uh, we award each year. So, um, so you saw the, the data in terms of the number of degrees. And so we're really just capturing how many students are, are we completing each year and using that as kind of the baseline for us. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a challenging metric, as, as is the transfer rate, right? Because not every student that comes to the college intends to transfer, right? And so how do you measure that and how do you separate um, those intentions from, from the very beginning upon uh, the entering the college? So. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's a, a challenging um, measure. One of the things though that, that we are working through is really looking at how many units are students earning upon completion, right? I think that's another metrics to say, you know, if a student can, can complete with 60 units to transfer or earn a degree, how many students, when they walk across that stage, how many units do those students have? Um, and so that's a metrics that we're focused on. Um, currently, um, we're about um, about 80 or so units that students on average earn and complete upon transfer. We have some high unit majors. So in those majors, that makes sense. Um, but I think there's an opportunity for us to do better, right? We don't want students taking classes that they don't need because that's money and time, right? So bringing down the number of units on average that students earn when they complete um, is really another metrics that we're focused on. We wanna be as efficient um, as possible and help students get on that path from the very beginning um, so that we can we can get them to where they need to be in terms of their degrees and their careers. Great. Any other questions from anyone? Um, Jane? I have a question. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, going to uh, looking forward to fall 2021, I would have thought that we would have been back in in-person classes. So I was a little disheartened to see your slide there. Can you speak a little more about fall 2021. I know it requires a lot of planning um, way in advance of knowing what the situation is going to be. But if you could talk to that a little bit, that'd be so great. That's a great, great question. And we're, we're engaged in those conversations because as you mentioned, the planning for our fall 2021 happens now, right? And so our current process right now is that students uh, register for summer and fall um, in April. And so we're building those courses to be able to put out that class schedule, um, you know, in, in March. And, you know, the way that it looks, um, you know, to have to make a determination in March about fall 2021 is challenging, right? <clears throat> and so what we're working on is we're wanting to uncouple the registration. So we're gonna have a separate summer registration, which will remain in April. And then we're looking at building another registration period for fall later in the summer buy us a little bit more time. So we're looking uh, hopefully to move that registration date maybe to June. Um, so that way, you know, we'll have a, a couple more months to be informed and, and we, can, we can be as nimble as we, we can at that point in time to determine 
uh, what that looks like. We, we believe me, we definitely want to be able to offer some face-to-face -face instruction and, and I'm with you that I, I'm, I'm hoping we can get there. Um, so we want to just buy a little bit more time so we're not having to commit, commit too early um, and not have to adjust um, with plans that we put out to the community. We want to, whatever we put out to the community, we want that to be accurate um, as possible. And so we're, we're going to buy a little bit more time. So, um, so registration most likely for fall will be pushed back to June. Okay, thank you so much. I know my son says he'll never take an in-person class for granted again. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, to, to, um, to build upon that point, the, the, the other concern is, you know, if we commit to all online in the fall, right, in, in, in the time frame that I mentioned um, in March, um, and of course things open up, and we are able to, to offer some more face-to-face -face instruction, not only would that um, you know, create confusion, right? Because we have a class schedule that's all online, but now we're saying, hey, we're gonna be face-to-face. -face. How do we communicate that to the community? But also, you know, we know that, that some of our other community colleges, right? Um, you know, we're not competitive, but we are kind of competitive, but you know, our other community colleges are also buying a little bit more time to kind of see. So we don't wanna be in a situation where we're all online and then our other colleges in our region are going face-to-face and then there's a potential for us to lose students who want that face-to-face -face instruction. So, so we're, we want to be in line with, with having that flexibility. So great question, Jamie. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Daryl, one more quick. Yeah, Ken. When, when, when my daughter graduated from Amador, God, it's been 10 years ago now, but back then it was, or my understanding or, or the feeling that I got was the people that went to community college either didn't have the grades to get into four-year school or couldn't afford a four-year school. And that's basically the only reason they went, other than the CTE stuff, you know, which was totally separate. But I tell you, I tell you what, if I knew then what I know now, yeah. you know, I, I, would, I would really be pushing her to Las Positas. But, and so my question is, what are you doing to, to get these, mainly the local students, you know, Livermore, Dublin, Pleasanton, that sort of thing, make them understand that this is a viable option and a, and a really good option for them. Because yeah. I don't, I know back then that was not understood, I don't think. I, I don't know if the counselors at the high schools didn't know it or what, but, but I think, you know, that, that would be something that we need, we need to do. That's, that's a great point, Ken. I appreciate that. And, and you're absolutely right that, that um, you know, I'll use the word stigma, right, has, has been out there for community colleges, right, as, as kind of being the last place you want to go, right, um, the 13th grade, no one wants to go to the community college. And historically, that, that has been kind of the, the, the impression that folks have had. Um, so we, we are working diligently with our um, high school counselors in particular, right, with our local community, and really just wanting to paint a different picture, right? And really emphasizing the transfer rates and, you know, the value of the education. So we, we have a lot of our story to still tell. Um, and I'll be honest that, that some of those impressions are still out there, right, in our community. And, and we're, we're working hard uh, with our outreach teams to really change that narrative. Um, and so, you know, we'll lean on all of you to help share that story too, right? In, in terms of uh, the benefits and, and the value that we offer at Las Vegas College. And so, so thank you for that, Ken. And, and that's a real challenge and, and we're working towards addressing that for sure. Good. We, we, just to follow up as well, you know, I had a daughter that went to Amador, Ken. Sounds like my kids went around the same time yours. And one of the teachers in there specifically talked about not going to community college. If you go to community college, you are wasting your time, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. You know, I'm a former school board member for the for Pleasanton School yeah. Board, and I just drove me crazy. So we actually have outreach. We outreach to the colleges. Uh, not, not too long ago, um, I had a counselor, I think from Liberal, no, from Pleasanton, contact me this, this a couple of years ago. And I said, look, come on up to campus. We will host your conversation, you know, they, they, they were looking for a room, a room to have an offsite. And I said, we can always provide that here on campus. But we wanted to get these counselors up here to see the campus. I had a couple of, I snuck in a couple of guest speakers from our counseling department, just to begin to change that mindset. And I don't think it's really the counselors so much. I think it's just a stigma that's really been hard. You know, we used to call ourselves a junior college, you know, we're a community college, right? We're not junior to anything. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that comment. We, you know, um, like John says here in the chat, yeah, you know, it's just it's just this kind of societal thing we have to get over. So thank you for being our uh, our ambassadors out there in the community. Right, that's right. And these opportunities help, Steve. So anytime we, we can get in front of the community and just share our story, 
um, in this venue and any other venue, we, we certainly welcome that opportunity. So, so thank you for this this time today. One, one sure. adder to that, uh, Daryl, is the the, the internships. Uh, I'm assuming that's the probably the best way, in my opinion, that to help educate the kids that that can work directly with the businesses in our community. So, just a thought. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great opportunity, definitely. Hey, just to add on to that, I remember hearing a few years back it was a it was a pretty high percentage of graduating seniors from Pleasanton Unified that actually were going to Las Positas College. And I, do we do we still have any statistics on that? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, from for last year, and, and we're still coming through the data for this year, um, you know, we get about um, 14 or 15 percent of, of students from um, from the Pleasanton Unified School District. Um, you know, there's data that that from the district that shares how many students go to uh, four-year universities directly, how many go to community colleges, um, and how many, how many take other options outside of, um, outside of graduation. Um, and so there, there's um, a great opportunity. I think the last data set that I saw was that about 30% um, of um, the uh, students in our local um, school districts go to community colleges. We want to be that community college, right? We want to be that community college. And we also, you know, want to be a viable option for those students that, that want to go to a four-year and, and to transfer to to your point um, earlier. Um, so, um, so I think I think there's still um, some great options for us. And and you know, to be honest, one of the conversations that we're going to start to engage in is is what are what are some built-in incentives that we can can provide to help incentivize students in our local district specifically. Uh, to come to LPC, um, and so we're we're going to have those conversations to see what 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 that would look like, um, because I think that that is something that we can easily do is is build in some incentives, whether it be some type of financial support or other types of you know support such as priority registration or whatever that may look like uh, for students who are coming directly from our local school district. So we'll um, we're still working on that. But great question, Brock. Great. <clears throat> well, thank thank you, Daryl, for uh, all your time and. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think we can all agree we're very fortunate to have you as our president at Las Positas College. Um, we hope you'll stay here for many years. Uh, and um, Lori, is there anything you'd like to say as we close out today's session? Is Lori listening still? Is she still with us? Uh, maybe not. I am. Oh, Thank there you. she is. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, we just appreciate people taking the time to come and join us at the chamber. We are such a varied group that uh, there's always uh, kernels of information that we can take and, and uh, share with others beyond the presentation. So we appreciate people's time. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, so we will have this posted on our website, uh, Daryl, and hopefully you uh, will be kind enough to send me your slideshow. Uh, you can post that as well. Um, we have people that, that look at it on our website, and, and we also share it on our uh, e-blast that we send out on Mondays. Um, just to let everybody know, uh, we'll be our next meeting will be on January 13th in 2021. I can't wait to say that uh, moving forward. Um, and it's going to be the East Bay Community Energy Organization. Uh, some of you know that Starting in the spring of next year, uh, Pleasanton residents will have the opportunity to purchase power from them versus PG&E. So it should be an interesting uh, discussion. So uh, same time, same channel. Um, and again, thank you again, Daryl, for your time. Uh, I wish everybody a safe and happy holiday. And um, signing off. All right, great. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Happy, holidays. Happy, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.